Now, the moment our eyes met, there was an instant connection. And no, I didn't hear any kind of background music begin to play. There was no doves released. But I can assure you that my heart skipped a beat. And just by the way, she held my gaze for the several seconds and gave me a sheepish grin in return. Well, I could tell that the attraction was mutual. The only problem was that she was much further in line at the LAX ticket counter where we were both waiting there to have our bags checked. And the line, as you can imagine, zigzagged as long as like a city block, it would seem. Always putting us in close enough proximity to keep each other within view, occasionally exchanging smiles with one another, but always far enough away to where I couldn't easily introduce myself. And when she had made it to the front counter and she had her bags checked, she didn't wait for me there, as I thought that maybe she might. She instead gave me one last longing look, a flip of the hair, one last smile before she traveled up the escalator that led up towards the waiting areas. And I was sure to track her with my eyes like a tractor beam so that I might be able to retrace her path. But once she reached the top of that escalator, well, she soon was out of my view. Once I had my boarding pass in hand, I quickly raced to the escalator and I began to ascend with a pretty good feeling about what would happen next. You see, as a young man, just 20 years old, well, I had already seen plenty of romantic movies to know how this scene was supposed to play out. You've seen it all before, haven't you? But when I reached the top of that landing, well, she was nowhere in sight. Things hadn't quite played out as I had imagined them in my mind. Now, of course, you might assume, I know, that I had just imagined everything, the attraction, the connection. Oh, but I assure you, those short, blissful moments we had shared together in line, oh, they were real. And so I had resolved that I would find her. It's this kind of moment that a lot of authors and screenwriters will refer to as the inciting incident of a story. It's the moment or it's the event that causes a character to take a determined action, launching them on a journey with certain obstacles to overcome. And in our story today in Genesis chapter 24, we're, we're going to watch a little bit of a, a chick flick play out where the inciting incident is provided by a father who in his old age has realized that his legacy now falls on the shoulders of his son and whether or not he will stay true to the faith. And this father... Well, he is old enough and wise enough to know that if a young man, if you want him to grow into a great man, well, you better go find him a great woman. And this is where our story begins. If you got your Bibles open or maybe your screen's on in Genesis chapter 24, beginning in verse 1, it says, Abraham was now a very old man and the Lord had blessed him in every way. One day Abraham said to his oldest servant, the man in charge of his household, take an oath by putting your hand under my thigh 
Swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, that you will not allow my son to marry one of these local Canaanite women. Go instead to my homeland, to my relatives, and find a wife there for my son Isaac. Now, you might have immediately noticed that they had a strange way of pledging an oath. (laughs) I mean, if you would ever like to make me some kind of promise, a gentleman's handshake will do just fine. No need to go placing your hand on my thigh, thank you very much. (laughs) The reason that it was a custom in Abraham's day was because it was their equivalent of what we would do when we placed our hand on a Bible and we would swear an oath. Because for them, the thigh was synonymous with the growing area where Abe's family carried the mark of God's covenant, which was for them circumcision. And so Abraham makes his most trusted servant swear on all things good and holy on God's very promises that he will travel back to his homeland to find a wife for his son, Isaac. He didn't want him marrying any of the local Canaanite women because they did not share his faith. In fact, the Canaanites, far from it. And Abe knew that if God were gonna continue Blessing and working through his family while Isaac was going to need a strong woman of faith to encourage him to continue following God even when things got difficult. And he figured that such a girl could certainly be found from among his own relatives back where he was from. And he also rightfully assumed that God would want this for Isaac as well. And so it says in verse four, Abe says, go instead to my homeland, to my relatives, and find a wife there for my son Isaac. The servant asked, but what if I can't find a young woman who's willing to travel so far from home? Should I then take Isaac there to live among your relatives in the land you came from? No, no. Abe responded, be careful never to take my son there. For the Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and my native land, solemnly promised to give this land to my descendants. He will send his angel ahead of you and he will see to it that you find a wife there for my son. If she is unwilling to come back with you, well, then you are free from this oath of mine, he says. But under no circumstances are you to take my son there. Now, Abraham is so adamant that his son not leave the land that they were in because he is now so confident in God's promise to deliver that land to them. You may remember if you were here last week, that uh, we saw Abe's family receive the first portion, like the first installment of the promised land. They considered it as, as a down payment by God, guaranteeing the rest. And so he wanted to be sure that Isaac was going to stay put so that God could deliver on his promise. It was sort of a way that Abraham had resolved to stay faithful to God and his promise. Which in your notes, it brings up this question for us in our own life. In what areas maybe do you need to resolve to stay faithful? And when you're answering that question, you know, a lot of times such conviction Well, it comes by way of an inciting incident in our life. A moment that maybe we think back to. And we wish that things would have gone a little differently. 
Maybe that we had made a better decision. Maybe we wish that we had stuck with God rather than going our own way. Now, Abraham, of course, he had made that mistake plenty of times before in his life. And so he was resolved not to make that same mistake again. He knew, he was certain that God was going to deliver on his promise, but he didn't know how. And he didn't know when. And it's that kind of uncertainty that always leads to the rising tension of a story. In fact, as we will look closely at this story, we'll find that, much, that there is much uncertainty even in the midst of such faith. Because maybe you already noticed that when Abraham told his servant what he must swear to do, well, he then acknowledges the, the slight possibility that things may not work out as planned. And if that is the case, he says, well, then you'll be released from the oath. But the man, the servant, he promised to do what Abe had said. And so he, in the story, he packs 10 camels for the trip. It would have been about a three-week journey. Along with all the provisions that he would need, he also packed some very expensive gifts for the family in case he did happen to find a bride. And he began his journey to northwest Mesopotamia, where Abraham was from. And when he arrived there, he rested his camels at a well that was just outside of town. And at that point in the day, the the sun hung low in the sky, and so he figured that it probable that some women might come by soon to to begin drawing water from that well, as was the custom. And so he prayed a prayer that we find in our Bibles in verse 12. Lord, he prays, God of my master Abraham, please give me success today and show unfailing love to my master Abraham. See, I'm standing here beside this spring And the young women of the town are coming to draw water. This is my request, he says. I will ask one of them, please give me a drink from your jug. If she says, yes, have a drink, and I will water your camels too, let her be the one you have selected as Isaac's wife. This is how I will know that you have shown unfailing love to your master. Now that may seem as maybe a little bit of a a simple test. Oh, but it would have taken a lot more kindness, patience, and hard work than you might imagine. Because you may know that a camel can go up to a couple of weeks without water. But did you know that when they do take a drink, They will drink up to 30 gallons of water. (laughs) So watering 10 camels, it is no small or quick task. It would have taken an hour or two of lugging around a big heavy jar that they carried around on their shoulders. It wasn't a task that someone would have likely just volunteered themselves for. But that provides a bit of the tension. Because you see, the servant, he has set up this scenario in which the odds are now against him. And he is counting on God to come through. And I don't know if you can identify with this in your own life, but I was thinking about this in mine (laughs) this last week. And that sometimes I think there's probably not enough tension in my own faith. Meaning that a lot of times I probably just play it safe. 
without really feeling that I need to count on God for much. A lot of times I might place myself in scenarios in which I feel like I can handle it well enough on my own. It isn't so big or it isn't so scary. It isn't so difficult that I feel like I really need to trust God to come through. And how about you? Where are you counting on God to come through? Now, because I had considered, because I had considered it God's provision, much more than just coincidence that I ran into the beautiful girl at the airport, at the top of the escalator now, her nowhere in sight, I, just like the servant in the story, I too said a little prayer that God would help me find her. Now, I will admit that it was a much simpler prayer than the servant prayed because he had prayed that God would help him find a woman of great character and a servant's heart. I prayed that God would just bring that really hot chick back into my life. (laughs) And with such a prayer then, I set off. Scanning the waiting areas, I scanned every gate, every chair, every little store in the airport, every little restaurant. And I know that some of you might think that that sounds somewhat stalkerish, but listen, keep in mind, all right, that I am placing my story in the genre of romantic comedy. So it was much more endearing than it was creepy, okay? Okay. And after a long time searching, with no luck at all, I finally had to give up. I felt like I experienced the kind of anguish that I think the following scene captures real well. Goodbye, my love. And it's after facing such heartbreak or what feels like some insurmountable obstacle, well, that the story normally reaches its climax. And in our chick flick today in Genesis chapter 4, it continues now in verse 15. And it says, before he had finished praying, this is the servant, he saw a young woman named Rebecca coming out with her water jug on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, who was the son of Abraham's brother Nahor and his wife Milcah. Rebekah was very beautiful and old enough to be married, but was still a virgin. And she went down to the spring, filled her jug and came up again. Running over to her, the servant said, please give me a drink of water from your jug. Yes, my Lord, she answered. Have a drink. And she quickly lowered her jug from her shoulder and gave him a drink. And when she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too until they have had enough to drink. Now again, that's a lot of water. Not only was she an answer to prayer, But she also surpasses all expectations because it says of her here and in other parts of scripture that she was incredibly beautiful. But you might remember that the the servant hadn't prayed for beauty. He had been mainly concerned with faith and character. But I am sure that he was well aware that this was going to help his cause. (laughs) I mean, if you were to ask any young man today, maybe if they would agree to an arranged marriage such as this, they would likely tell you, heck no, 
Of course not. It's crazy. If you were to hold up a, a picture of a supermodel and say, oh, this is her, they'd likely say, well, yeah, I could, I could really see myself loving her. <laughs> and I think that this servant probably knew that as soon as Isaac laid eyes on Rebecca, that he would be more than happy with this arranged marriage. Of course, not all climaxes to a story result in such a great outcome as, as this one here in Genesis chapter 24. Sometimes, well, they offer a little more of a plot twist, and such was the case. After I had searched far and wide for my beautiful girl in the airport, I finally, of course, gave up that search, never even having gotten the chance to talk to her. And dejected, with my head hung low, I headed to the bathroom. And upon entering, as fate would have it, there she was. I couldn't believe my luck. And she began walking towards me with that same smile on her face that she had given me before. And not even considering at all where I was, but only thinking of my good fortune, I enthusiastically approached her. And I said, hi, my name's Brent. And she paused. She then looked behind her at all the other women, women there standing at the counter in front of the mirror. And she turned back towards me. And she said, this must be really embarrassing for you. <laughs> and it was only then that it dawned on me why I had gotten such strange looks from all of these ladies. Now the servant encounter here at this well with the ladies goes much better because after passing the test that Rebecca was completely unaware of, she then invites Abraham's servant to stay with her and her family. Another sign again of just the kind of person that she was. And in verse 26, the man bowed low and worship the Lord, praise the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, he said. The Lord has shown unfailing love and faithfulness to my master, for he has led me straight to my master's relatives. In your notes, you can write this down if you're taking notes this morning, that great stories are made from good character. Abraham shows us character by just simply staying true to what he believed that God desired for him and his family. Rebecca is shown to be a person of great character, which is why God would lead her to being at just the right place at just the right time. What originally would have felt to her as just simply a coincidence and I think that that will often be the case when we're focused on growing in our character. That coincidence may seem to happen that is actually more of God's providence than maybe we even realize. You see, it may be him getting us to just where he wants us to be or maybe it's where he needs us to be in order to write something great in our life or the life of another person. Character is what often puts us in position to be used by God. Now, after I had completely humiliated myself in the women's restroom, <clears throat> I actually saw that girl a couple more times afterwards and each time I hid. I was so embarrassed that I felt there was no redeeming myself after that. 
But there would come another girl. A few years later where romance would have a much more happier ending. And it's all because, you see, I was able to put myself in position to be noticed. I'd become interested in this really cute girl at church. And I knew that she worked at this hair salon. And as fate would have it, my best friend's grandma just happened to get her hair done at the same hair salon. And at the time, well, I was pretty sure what went on in those women's salons. A bunch of girl talk. And so one evening while I was at my friend's house who he lived with his grandparents, with his grandma sitting in the room, able to listen in on our conversation, I told my friend all about this really great, really cute girl that I had met at church and also where she just so happened to work at the hair salon. Now as a pastor, I need to tell you this morning that I cannot condone gossip, all right? It is not good. However, it can prove useful. (laughs) As it did in my case, because you see, my hope was that the next time my grandma or his grandma went to have her hair done at the salon, that she might mention, you know, bring up my interest to this certain girl. Hopefully, maybe even talking me up. And if the girl seemed interested in me, well, I was counting on his grandma also to not be able to keep such a good piece of gossip to herself. Now, I know that that is not a romantic or gallant approach to expressing your interest to a girl. It's certainly not any way to sweep her off of her feet But if you're wondering if such a ridiculous plan could ever work, well, we're married now, so there's that. And it was all really just because I was able to put myself in position to be noticed. And it's not as though we ever go unnoticed by God, but I do think that we put ourselves oftentimes in position For him to work in us and through us when we're focused on growing in our character. Or in other words, striving to live by his word and to become more like Jesus. Whenever that's the case, just like the servant acted as a representative for his master Abraham, so too we can become a representative of God to those around us. Because when we live with God's character, well, others may be able to get a glimpse of him through us. And then there's Abraham's servant who also found himself at the right place at the right time to be used by God. And I think that it was because he was already headed in the right direction. You see, in verse 27, I want to give it to you in another translation. This is when he marvels over how God had led him to Rebekah. And then in the New King James Version, he says, As for me, being on the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. And I like the idea that he was already on the way. Because it means that God didn't have to alter his direction or try to get him moving. It was actually easy for God to intercede in this situation, into this story, because the servant had already been on his way. If there were a big, heavy object here on stage and I was asked to move it, I may be able to do it with a lot of effort 
But what would make the task a whole lot easier is if that object were already in motion, right? If it was already headed the right way, and then, well, it would just require me to to maybe help it along, to give it some guidance. And I think that's true also when it comes to God working in our lives. Now, to be clear, God can work in and through anybody. He has no limitations. There is not anything or anyone that is beyond his reach. But we will find that he most often chooses to use people for his purposes who are already on the way, those who are intentionally moving towards God with their lives, striving to live by his word and honor him with the way that they're living. And when our lives are already headed in the right direction, what we do is we place ourselves in position then, in a greater position to be used by God for his glory. Because great stories are made from good character. And that leads us to the resolution. Abraham's servant, he could clearly see that God had orchestrated this encounter with Rebecca. And to confirm that even further, of course, Rebecca had invited the servant to stay with her family. And over dinner then, he told them his whole story, who he had been sent by, what his objective was, and how God had led him to Rebekah. And he then, on behalf of Isaac, makes this marriage proposal, which in those days was done to the family. It was more of a family decision And the family agreed, well, surely it seems like God is behind this. And so Rebecca and the servant, they begin their journey back to Abraham and Isaac the following day. And the story concludes in verse 63. It says, one evening as he, which is now speaking of Isaac, One evening as he was walking and meditating in the field, he looked up and he saw the camels coming. When Rebecca looked up and saw Isaac, she quickly dismounted from her camel. Who is that man walking through the field to meet us? She asked the servant. And he replied, it is my master. So Rebecca covered her face with her veil and then the servant told Isaac everything that he had done. And Isaac brought Rebekah into his mother Sarah's tent and she became his wife and he loved her deeply and she was a special comfort to him after the death of his mother. It's a love story that you could say is a little bit of a predictable ending. But that's because whenever God is involved in the writing process, ultimately the final resolution It's all good. It's why it tells us in Romans 8, 28 that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes. Now that doesn't mean that we aren't gonna face a lot of difficult plot twists along the way or a lot of rising tension maybe as sometimes our faith is gonna be challenged with disappointments, maybe even some failed expectations that we had of God. But it does mean that as the final credits begin to roll on our life, that we get a happily ever after when we have given our life to Jesus and have lived for him. In fact, I I wanted to come here even with the, the raspy voice and teach this message this morning because this story is such an important one. Because really, it's actually our story 
A lot of theologians believe that this story here in Genesis chapter four is actually meant to be a preview of a coming attraction. It's like a trailer for our own feature film to come because it alludes to the love story that God has written for each and every one of us. And as the credits now begin to roll for this Genesis chapter 20, 24 story, we might take some special interest in the roles that each character might seem to play in the next. Because it could be said of Abraham that he represents God the Father. And Isaac then would, of course, represent Jesus. God the Father's son. And in our future story, Rebecca, her part gets played by us or the church. Because scripture very often uses this analogy for the church as being as a bride to Jesus, who is referred to as our bridegroom. And then there is the servant who was commissioned to find a bride for Isaac. And in the next story, well, he would represent the Holy Spirit. In fact, it doesn't use his name here in this chapter, but if you go back a little bit, it does use his name. It tells us his name in Genesis chapter 15. And this, this servant's name was Eliezer, which in Hebrew means God's helper, which of course is how Jesus very often refers to the Holy Spirit in our New Testaments. And it's the Holy Spirit at work in us that brings us then into a relationship with Jesus, being our bridegroom. And because of that relationship with Jesus, we get welcomed into the family of God. The only question remaining on your notes is have you found yourself in the story? Have you fully given yourself to Jesus? Maybe even if you could imagine as you would in a marriage, not only saying yes to Jesus, but also now working to grow deeper in that relationship with him. The worship team can come up. And I'm reminded in the New Testament of how Jesus instituted communion with his disciples. You see, he took the elements, the two elements that were part of that Passover meal that they were sharing together, the, the bread and the wine. And he asked his followers to eat and to drink of them to remember what he was about to do on the cross. And there's a lot of symbolism in those two elements as being part of the Passover meal. But I wonder if his disciples also would have connected marriage to the way that Jesus presented this cup of wine to them. Because you see, in those days, a marriage proposal wasn't made with a ring and a guy getting on a, a bended knee. It was instead done by a man presenting a cup of wine to a woman after getting the blessing of the family and the father. And he would express his desire to begin this new life with her. And then he would take a sip of the cup and he would then present it to her. And if she accepted his proposal, then she would drink of it as well. And Jesus, well, he does a little bit of a similar thing. When he holds up the cup of wine and he asks each of them to drink from, from it, 
And it would, would have then been passed around the table, each person making the choice if they were going to accept what it stood for. And for us today, communion, if you have it in your hands this morning, communion becomes a similar proposal to us. You see, it is an invitation into an even deeper relationship with God. Such a relationship that's only made possible by what Jesus did on the cross. That bread, if you're holding that in your hands, represents his body that he gave for our sake. The juice represents his blood by which our sins can be forgiven by which God no longer sees us through the stain of our sin, but he instead sees us through the blood, through the love of his son, Jesus. This morning, as we sing this last song, you're welcome, of course, to sing. But if you have communion too, would you think of it as that proposal to you of going even deeper in a relationship with God. Lord, many of us take the time now just to consider where we might find ourselves in your story. And Lord, we thank you that you make us a part of it. Lord, that you invite us in, that through your spirit, you draw us nearer to you. Lord, as many of us hold the communion in our hands, may we accept that proposal just to say, God, I want more of you. And it's only because of what Jesus did on the cross that I'm able to be with you, Lord. Thank you for what you've done. Lord, we thank you for the love story that you have written not only in our lives, but all throughout creation. Would you meet with us now, we pray. In your name, amen.